Okay, time to fire up. A um, little more about myself. I studied here in Utah, finished my PhD at, at Utah State, and uh, took a job at the University of Wisconsin where I'm now. Um, but I'm going to start just right into it because um, I'd like us to connect with your own experiences and so forth at the end and have enough time because I find most people run it right to the end and hopefully I've done the same thing that we can connect a little more because I feel there's a real need for connecting. Sometimes at the conference you get to hear a lot but that you lack the opportunity to really have a meaningful uh, discussion. So let me jump right into it. I'm looking at obviously what we all understand is the them and us situation that we deal with in, in um, open education and the them being the well-funded for-profit enterprises who buy up content, hire the experts, and dominate the market with copyright that never expires. Um, so that's kind of a straightforward, quick jump on who they are. So um, then you'd say, okay, who are the us? The us are the former, the, them's former customers. <laughs> um, now, obviously, we educators, instructional developers, um, subject matter experts, and the likes. Now, I want to dig right into the battle. Who is going to win here and how is it possible for us to win? Now obviously if I had to play devil's advocate and say, okay, if I were to consult with them and say, you know, how can you keep the us dead and out and eliminate it? That's a very important question that we have to answer. And um, I'm going to look at these principles uh, of being unified, visionary, focused, sustainable and so forth and go through them and then I'll look at the uh, we principles and, and look at what saves us in that case. So, as we look at these principles, I'm going to touch on each one of them briefly. Um, obviously, unified. The concept of unified, you're all familiar with the cathedral and the bazaar analogy. If not, go Google it. Um, but that whole thing of a, uh, they've got a very orderly plan environment, that, um, so they can plan a great strategy. They've got the funding. They've got the subject matter experts. They've got what it takes to, to beat the market, and they do it. Um, very effective at that. So that's in their favor, they unify. A second thing is, they're visionary. They know what's coming at it down the pipe. And, and obviously, um, within their own realms, you've got those who fall out, and, and new ones that come in, as old ones dominate with a specific environment, but don't see the future, and so forth. But you can definitely say they have vision in where they go with it. They take their products to new platforms, they localize it to languages all over the world, they dominate in impressive ways. Um, so immediately as you look at these, you say, well, how about us? How do we deal with these same things? Obviously, they focused on money specifically. I worked in the corporate world, and I understand that, that uh, environment. Now, being in the education environment, I'm often frustrated with the lack of experience and understanding of what money does and, and how to play that game. Um, that is not something that goes away. Um, we have to deal with it, too, obviously, in different ways. So they have a short-term and a long-term vision. Their focus is there. And then we've dealt a lot with the concept of sustainability. Now, they've got the upper hand on the sustainability for sure because they've got an economic model that maintains that's one very key uh, portion of, of keeping their ball rolling. Um, so, and then the other thing is mind share. That's a fight, a big fight, um, is mind share. And we've seen the whole infrastructure giving them the mind share, basically. We've got request for proposals. That hands it to them on a plate, if you go that way. That's old school thinking. That's traditional. So that concept of mind share, of how we can sway mind share, and we can't do it by uh, trying to compete on a request for proposal. We have to capture mind share in another way, that people say, I don't think an RFP is the way to go today, and come up with new ways of, of evaluating and and being inclusive of the environment that we offer. So, and obviously they're cutting edge, um, and we often envy what they deliver and produce. So now let's look at the other side. What is the our strengths that we can uh, book on? Not that we have to ignore the, their strengths, we have to counter it effectively, of course. Um, so, number one is a very important one. We've got strength in numbers. Uh, we've seen this proven with software development. Um, as the open uh, source uh, stuff took off and, and, and freeware and crowdsourcing and so forth started to happen, of course there was a lot of skepticism about it, but it's proven its value. Not every model works and there's a high percentage of failures, but there are some phenomenal successes as well. And that's obviously an environment to pull from is um, 
how can we harness the strength of our numbers? Something that goes very well with strength and numbers is we have the expertise, not them. They come and steal it from us. And they, you know, lure us away with the money, money. Come, 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 here's the money. And we go. Um, if you need the money, you go. Uh, one thing that I see that counters us uh, with expertise where we can stand is that we have people that really believe in the cause. And if you have a job already, although not well funded, but you have money coming in and you can put bread on the table, often that higher cause that we, we that unites us is something that is in our strength. And I'll touch on that in a second. So the world is connected today. That serves them too, but it serves us really well. We've just had some great examples in the plenary of the connectedness of all over the world, people contributing and so forth. How can we exploit that connectedness to make this really happen? And then I, um, the openness, obviously, um, in, in finding and stuff is great. I'm not going to touch much on that. That's been touched on a lot. But I want to touch on the concept of weeness. I call it weeness. And what I mean by that is there is a ethic, there is a similar sharing that we have in this room that binds us, that's why we're here. Um, and that is that common good, that wanting to share, and that whole thing of why we share. And it's deeper than financial things, and it's stronger than financial things for most. It's that weeness that I think can take us the long way. And if that weeness is strong, then we'll have the staying power to take us right to the successful end. But it leaves us with many complexities. As we look at the strengths that the other side have of having the money, pulling together the forces, knowing their market, delivering what's needed, and, and we seem to be disjointed often. We are scattered all over, and we, the, bringing unity is the main thing that you need. That divide and rule principle is absolutely decimating our efforts. Um, they are able to keep us divided, um, not necessarily by sowing discontent amongst us, but by creating a unified vision of where it is. And when you look at uh, open stuff, it, it seems so amateurish, so scattered, so, yeah, not now. In fact, maybe that's true. Maybe we are there. We are scattered, we are weak, and we still have to look at the future of where we're going with this. That, that's what keeps us um, back right now. But the one thing I always stress when, when we talk about this, when I tell people about adopting software, and the, you know, you've got one mindset of, you know a Chevy Nova. You know it's a crappy little car. It's never going to be a smart, great vehicle that you would totally recommend it. It's meant to be a little cheapy. And when I say something like Mercedes-Benz and BMW and likewise, then you'll have a, a much higher standard. Those standards are maintained through the decades. It doesn't come up and down. Whereas, say, when we deal with software environment, it's up and down all the time. And so sometimes you find something that's insipid today, give it a year, and you'll be totally surprised how it can be overall and renewed and revitalized. Um, I saw that with um, Linux. When Linux started out, it was yeah, not ready for showtime. Promising, not ready for showtime. You look at it today, it's a totally different story. So in, in our environment, we have to keep the hope of that. That yes, we're divided right now, and there's lots that we need to do, we will get there. And it's this persistence that we need to sustain power to keep, get us there. So a few caveats to consider as well. Um, one thing that's very important, and now we deal with those who are beholden to them, mostly. And that is the, the first one I want to die, talk about that I always ask people is, what's your exit strategy? In other words, if you buy into anything, one of the first questions I ask is, if I were to approach the vendor, I'd say, okay, can you tell me your exit, uh, my exit strategy that you have provided for me. In other words, I'm now going to enter your realm. If I ever want to exit, how will it happen? And if they ever come, oh, I don't know why you would want to do that, then this conversation's over. If they say, oh, it's completely easy, we follow open standards, this is how you do it, you can come and go as you please, and really make it easy and, and, and fully support my exit from them. I'm interested and in, can go on to step two. So an exit strategy is very important. You cannot get people away from them if they have bought into an, an environment that there's no exit strategy to. And it's like, oh, I can't even imagine us leaving or pulling out of this. It will cost us so much. We are so embedded in this environment. No way. 
The second thing is proprietoriness. I worked for Word Perfect here in the Valley in the good old days. Uh, the European Union obviously used Word Perfect as the default product. They came to Word Perfect and said, would you mind opening your file format as an open standard? Because we've got so many documents in your file format, we really need that. Word Perfect said, nope. <laughs> the rest is history. They died. That one decision killed them. They had said, sure. Very different story today. Kill them. And so, um, watch out for proprietoriness. When people come and lock you into a file format that they hold, that's theirs, and it's not open, and it's not a standard. It is an absolute poison to your future, if you, if you go there. Rather, hold your horses and do something less shiny and wait for the standard to arrive. The other one is what I call the flesh pots of Egypt. <laughs> and that, I remember my mom telling me the story of the Israelites leaving and heading for the Red Sea and so forth, and the murmuring. You know, this is really tough, and it was so good back there when we at least had meat to eat. Now we're just starving in the desert. This is how we are on a journey, and we are heading through the Sinai Desert right now. And, and all our friends yearn for the flesh pots of Egypt, and that is the when they, when the them comes and says, oh, just a one-button solution, everything is really, we've totally done. And it's true, they really have good stuff. And, um, and you're like, ah, I just, I, we've got to go back to the flesh parts of Egypt. And so that, that is a, a big one. And obviously the thing of perceived value is a real uh, clincher and a very important thing to understand. So this, these economic principles are very important. I'll give you a perceived value one. Are there any Microsoft people here? Sink down, please. <laughs> Hi, because this one's going to hit Microsoft a bit. In Wisconsin, we localized all our products to Microsoft stuff. Just you know, just if it's Microsoft, sure we want it because we, everything is so nice and integrated and works so well. La -la -la. That logic, and we, we thought, just wise, you know, you can't go wrong with Microsoft. Then the licensing negotiation came around, and the Microsoft guy said, Yeah, we're going to significantly up your license. <laughs> what do you mean, the fees? Sure. <coughs> This is nuts. I mean, this is unfair, and the people got real riled up. But we localized everything we've got to your products. I mean, we give you way more business. You should now lower our prices instead. And the guy said, the perceived value of our products has been increased significantly. And, and, uh, and because of the perceived value of our products, we are increasing our price. What was he saying? You were so stupid to localize the, our products. Now you are in our back pocket. It's going to cost you so much to leave us, and we know that. You're going to have to pay more because we can't charge you more because you are now stuck. And that's really what the reality was. And they had to pay more because leaving would be more costly. And so they dug a hole for themselves out of ignorance. So those are some of the big ones. So now I want to touch a little bit on uh, some of the development I've done. The first principle that I want to stress is what I call um, zoom level awareness. If I were to show you a graph um, and you see it dip and then shoot up, would you be impressed? It takes a dip and then shoots up very nicely at a 45 or higher. It'd be very impressed. But what if I zoom out and you see this little thingy is a little blip in a solid path down. Are you still impressed? Oh, whoa, 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 I didn't know that was the bigger picture. So with, with the graph environment, you can clearly see sometimes you myopically fixed on just one little day of training. And it looks, whoa, things are going up. But when you look at 90 days, oh, it's pathetic. It's shooting straight for the floor. And so, okay, 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 get it. Now that Principle is very important as we deal with our stuff. Unfortunately, a criticism to our field at large is we're myopic in our development. We focus on me and my course and what I need and our standards and our, our, our just my little world. That's all I care about, so I develop for my world. So when you zoom back, where do you go with all of these little granules that are so um, developed? They're not connected and so forth, and you realize so much replication is happening in this process. And so that is a real problem. The zoom level is very important to keep in mind. Now I'm going to go with another thing that to address this. I call it the menu versus the pantry approach. Think food. Um, sit down in the restaurant. Here's your menu. 
Okay? You obviously, here you go, this is what you eat. Let's change the game. We've got a pantry. A pantry can serve four restaurants attached to it. And they all come, the, the chefs all come to the same pantry, get their stuff, cook up their food, and the menu goes out and so forth. I want to encourage you to consider the um, pantry approach. In other words, when I say menu approach, I often think we myopically think of our, the course that we're teaching, the, the specific standards we have to meet. That's our menu. That's what we have to deal with. When you think of the pantry approach, you think of the discipline. When you think of math, you think of all the sub areas and how it can be addressed. And, and, and so you think of that. And now, so that's the bigger layer. And then you can bring your menu and pull from the pantry of what you need. So keep that concept in mind. That helps you a bit with the zoom level mindset uh, of how we design and how we plan. That we're not myopically stuck just with our standards, but think the content for the, for the larger course. And sometimes uh, across several, for example, I do language teaching, and, and I'll show you at the end my language um, site. It covers four semesters. It covers all beginner and intermediate level foreign language learning in what I do. And, and they're all accommodated in the same environment. Instead of, we've got to do the 101 and then create a whole new course for the 102. That mindset's vital. And so, uh, a quick little vision for less commonly taught languages. That's what that LCTL, LICTLs as they call them too, less commonly taught languages. Problem with less commonly taught languages, you have a few students here, no teacher. A teacher there, no students. It's wonderful to bring it to the web. In short, what I'm trying to establish with openlanguages.net is that you've got one mega site that serves internationally anybody in the, in the world with that site. So go really global. It is from English. My la language that I'm doing right now, I'm doing Korean and Afrikaans. Afrikaans is my native language, so I'll focus on that for now. It's obviously from English to Afrikaans, but the environment's already plumbed that we're doing it from German to Afrikaans, from Italian to Afrikaans, and wherever the need is from any language to Afrikaans. So it's got that global perspective in mind. Um, so that you can um, offer Afrikaans, let me take Afrikaans as an example. Um, I can, I'm at the University of Wisconsin, we have a system of you know, 13 campuses. That the course can be offered at any of those campuses, they all join the same group. And we might have 30, 40 students, but that's plenty. And then you can go beyond that and then bring on cohort teachers, kind of like you have firemen in waiting. Um, if the fire is bigger, they call a few more. Um, have that kind of a facilitation. This, the, the site can serve and it's open. You can uh, participate in the course outside of a university environment. It's totally an open resource and learning environment. So here are some of the big picture suggestions that I've got that I've already touched on with many. And that is one is uh, granular developments need to merge with the same granules elsewhere. I've actually asked a few people that already. As I hear here in Utah, we're developing this course, and in Arizona, we're developing the same course. Well, why don't we have one course where we get these people to talk together and go for the content, and instead of just myopically focusing on our standards and our specifically what we want, but go for a bigger picture? Then you develop a table of contents that pulls from that. Hyperlinking makes it really easy. You don't have to just have just your stuff. You can have a table of contents that pulls what you need, and the rest could be in, of interest to them, but not necessity. So that's the example there, which I gave you of the second grade class that can, um, you know, we, we, that collaboration can happen widely. That pulling more people and building critical mass, where something becomes really good that others would want to join it, that is attractive once that starts to happen. Um, I really uh, emphasize a modular mindset. Modular mindset is where you understand which layers to separate from others. Because sometimes if you mush it too much, it really serves just one need. But if you can separate, for example, think of YouTube. It's a great modular thing. It pulls all the videos into one repository. Oh, do the videos still serve you perfectly? Of course it does. You can pop a YouTube video anywhere you want it in your site. But it comes from the module of videos. Uh, that mindset, I think, is very important because it makes things very flexible and reusable. Um, so if you just push it, mush it all together just in your own it's a, it's a one, what I call a zoom level problem. You gotta zoom back and see how these things need to come together and at what point, and not immediately throw everything together. Um, I want to, not much has been said about this, but I strongly encourage you not to ignore accessibility. Um, get some blind students, blind people on board, let them test your site, give you feedback, but don't ignore that. It will come back to haunt you. 
because of uh, you know federal regulations and so forth, eventually they're going to come down. And you've if you've built this whole building and suddenly realize we didn't do any plumbing, damn, <laughs> that's not fun to go and figure out how to get your toilets in this building and plumb it if you didn't even plan for it. So that we it's the same kind of problem, not to be ignored. And then one totally odd suggestion that I've had for years that I just want to drop as a totally separate little thing. I've always dreamt of a public domain taxonomic driven image repository. And this is how I would view it. It's like Flickr, but it's, it's, it's like a tree structure like we saw on Yahoo this morning. So you go, okay, I want to learn about plants. Um, actually, trees is what I mean to you. Deciduous trees, da, 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 and you can see images of every deciduous tree that there is. Um, and, and all those images are contributed totally in the public domain. No copyright whatsoever. No strings. Zero, zero, zero strings. Not, well, you've got to read the copyright. None of that nonsense. Get that talk out of there. Submit it. Totally open. You can make money with it. You can mess with it as, as much as you want. It's free and for, for everybody to use. And with that, I've got also the about.com. So for example, if I'm a botanist by trade and, and I've got lots of images of specific things, I take over a turf of this environment where then I collect and solicit images to build the thing. And I go nuts to make sure I fill my area. And there's a machinist that, that's really into locomotives that collects images of locomotives. And so you build a massive image repository. I think something like that would be a massive bonus globally, of course. But it has to be totally free and open. None, no, no strings and all, all the pens. None of those depends. It's just totally, totally open. And then lastly, I want to touch just um, give you my details and now quickly show you my site. Oops, there we go. As you notice with this, so I've got um, use the same template for many languages. With lots of tools that's been developed, I've got a nice cozy relationship with the university in Austria. They develop nice tools for me in Flash tools often and so forth. It blesses any language. If I get a small language out of an obscure part of Asia or Africa joining, all the tools are available to them. So it's just wonderful to step into an environment that's really uh, ready and plumb to go. What you will notice here that I want to show you is the modularity of it. So with pronunciation, I've got a specific focus and for every language has difference on the vowels, the consonants, and whatever else they've got. And then a holistic focus where you've got songs and, and poetry and stuff that you can see the text and hear it and, and learn to pronounce by uh, interacting with holistic stuff. I've got lots of stuff for vocabulary, uh, cool tools and so forth with carousels that you can go through with flashcards and learn with uh, rich media and so forth. So all kinds of cool ways to learn it in a whole topic-centric um, um, you know, way to do, do the vocabulary and so forth. Grammar will be different for every language. Uh, this one is very particular to Afrikaans, how this is developed. Then a whole cult culture, oops, a whole culture <coughs> environment with all kinds of culture stuff that can always go on. It's very exciting to do that. And a very important one, and that's the communication one. I've got beginner topics, kind of based on the uh, ACTFL's OPI thing of the type of topics that you do with the beginner level and then intermediate level and so forth. Ties in very nicely with the vocabulary and so forth, um, with samples of uh, people speaking and saying the stuff and so forth, and go on and on. Now the important thing, this is to me the cherry on the cake, and what I'm going to show you here is this. The curriculum. I've got a curriculum here for Afrikaans 101. Oops, I lost it there, sorry. So I'm going to go here to the curriculum and show you this thing. The, the curriculum for Afrikaans 101 here, um, it's, let me just scroll to there, there's week one for pronunciation, vocabulary, communication, and grammar. All of it pulled from the thing. Let's say four of you also teach Afrikaans and you're somewhere else in the States. All you do is this page for yourself. And you hook it up into the site or wherever you please and you've got your own situation. So you don't have to buy in to what this offers because this is a pantry. And you can make additions to this and expand the pantry because mm -hmm. some thing, it's like building a city. It's just very vast. So you can never hit everything. So um, I find this is one interesting solution. When I started this, this development, as I said, I was here in Utah teaching Afrikaans. I moved to Wisconsin, I moved kind of out of uh, the language teaching thing and I decided I was still very into the open languages thing and I thought, I'm going to do something different here. What I'm going to do is not develop a course for my class and open a window on the side and say everybody can come in and watch what we're doing. 
forget the class. I'm developing it open to the world. But now, that's why I went modular. If you know the language already, you can go wherever you want to in the thing. It's not like a chronology or a, a linear process like a table of contents of a book. You really should follow this logic. You build that on top of it. Zoom, zoom, focus. You've got all the pieces there. You can now build your layer on top of that. And I find this has really changed the, the game in allowing many more people to use the same resources. Because if we go with the old traditional logic of just doing it for myself, well, what would I want to do then? I would want to pull some of your pieces and go put it in my bucket because we do the same thing. But I do it this way, you do it that way, so I just want to pull some of yours. But if you zoom out and I just do the focus on the subject matter, and I myself had to build my table of contents, so do you, but we focus on the same resource. So it makes it way more accessible and reusable within the same contents. Thank you. Let's open for questions. Please. So I don't see that you have any Creative Commons license attributed on your site. Is there a reason why you... I just have not given that thought to, to deal with that and do it. Uh, a good observation, I'll have to obviously, uh, you know, eventually pop that on. But I've been so inundated with everything else that I just haven't sat down and said, okay, now I'm, I'm going to put that. I've had that question fairly recently too, and I'm thinking, yeah, I better get to that. But we'll get to that. So up there are the weeks listed, right? So is there a way to do it as a self-paced model? Or, or you just have to avoid looking sure. at the weeks? Sure. Oh, oh, you, you see, this, this page can be redesigned depending. If you've got an independent study, um, I'll show you one thing. For example, when it comes to culture, culture is not on this list. When I come to week eight, scroll down fast. Here, in week eight, I just say, OK, you've got to weeks one through four, you've got to know this stuff. So you can, you know, Shape it how you want to. You can say within the first six months you need to cover these things. You figure out how you want to uh, order them and progress through them. So yeah, the, uh, you've got total flexibility in how you order things still. But the nice thing is the infrastructure is not lockstep. That you make assumptions of how people think and so forth. And then when you build this on top of something else that has already got an imposition on it, then it's not so well suited. And then you would want to pull that stuff out to do the thing properly. And that solves that problem. Having a modular approach that you can build your table of contents based on your needs, and, and, and it's really the, the design of it is free of the, an imposition of a specific order. And then also at the beginning there, it said something about a credit unit. Uh, yeah. Some yeah, yeah, because I'm at a university, so this is built specifically for that based on my specific needs. And so whatever <coughs> your situation is, um, I'm, you know, you can, I can also build one just for people in general, adults who want, want to learn the language. I could make recommendations of how to proceed if you can spend a half an hour a day. This is some uh, progress that I could suggest, and if you can spend less or more, you can have different paths. So it's very flexible in addressing different audiences. Final question? Yes? Have you seen any difference in the student? Achievement levels in terms of moving into this environment, you know, their engagement with the material, or anything uh, like that. A, a very important question. Our time's up, so I'll be very quick on this. Um, doing foreign language online is a tough job, and um, I initially we did, had it as an asynchronous class. With about a week into it, I realized a big mistake, and I've added a synchronous component o uh, online. Of course, that's a very important thing. What I'm working on right now is just about perfected. I'm just weeks away from having it in, so unfortunately I don't have it here. Is guess what I found is to me a bigger problem than how rich the content is and how well it teaches? Is the student managing all the pieces that they have to address and master. So I've developed a very interesting graph um, with all the assignments on it. And they, the assignments move down to the deadline as the time moves on. And you want to rest that assignment before it hits the deadline. So you click on it, you go to the thing, you do it, and, that, and, and you check that you've done it, and it arrests it right there. So you've got this one visual graph that shows you everything you need to do. And you go and just do it and stop it before it hits the deadline, uh, and, you know, the, the electric wire, and you're good. And, and so I'm, I now have to test it, but I'm very excited about that because I think just plain students managing the process is the bigger problem. It's not, how, you can have the coolest stuff, they're still stuck with that problem. So I've moved into that, we did it with Hagenberg, and it looks very promising. So if anyone you visit with me afterwards, I'd love to show you more stuff and visit with you on any of these issues. Time's up, thank you very much.